here's an outline of what we're going to cover in this video. First, we'll give the double pulse test technical background. Second, we'll give the double pulse test setup. And last, we'll give a lab demonstration of how to perform a double pulse test. The reason we do double pulse test is it gives us a way to evaluate and optimize the switching performance of discrete power MOSFETs. The double pulse test circuit shown here on the left measures the currents and voltages across the switch position. The test allows the device's waveforms to be studied over the full range of operating conditions. The dynamic performance evaluation, it allows us to capture the timing, including our delay on, our delay off, as well as our rise and fall times. We're able to capture the overshoots, including VDS max and ID peak. We're able to measure the switch speed, including our DIDT and DVDT and we're able to capture our switching energies, including our E on, E off, and E reverse recovery. Here is an overview of the waveforms in the double pulse test. Period T1 is when we turn on the lower switch and the current is allowed to build through the inductor until we reach our target current. At this time, the lower switch is turned off and this is where we capture the turn off energy. For a brief period of time, the current will then free will through the upper switch position and after a brief period, we turn the lower switch on again and this is where we capture our turn on energy or E on as the current is commutated from the upper position to the lower position. And after a brief period of time, we then turn the lower switch off. Shown here are the waveforms captured during the MOSFET turn on. We take the product of VDS and ID, which gives us our power shown in the red. And to capture the energy, we simply take the integral between the points marked on the diagram. Shown here are the waveforms captured during the MOSFET turn off or E off. Once again, VDS and ID are multiplied, which gives us the power shown in red and to capture the energy, we simply integrate between the points shown on the diagram. Shown here are the waveforms for capturing the diode turn off or reverse recovery energy. The inductor is now placed across the lower position and it is the upper switch that is driven and we take the integral between the points shown on the curve to capture our reverse recovery energy. Now we would do a double pulse lab demonstration using a speed valve kit. I'm Julius Rice, application engineer with Wolf Speed. Today, I'll be showing you how to take double pulse measurements with the speed valve kit. First, let's talk about the equipment that we need to take these double pulse measurements. I'm using a Tektronix 5 series oscilloscope, and we have a rack here with a number of pieces of equipment that you're gonna need. First, we have a digital multimeter. This allows us to measure the link voltage so that we can set it to whatever the target voltage is. We have a function generator. This is going to allow us to inject the PWM pulses to turn the switches on. We have a power supply, which is going to source the 12 volts that's needed to drive the wolf speed kit. And lastly, we have a high voltage power supply that's used to charge up the link voltage to the target voltage. Now I'm gonna show you how to make all the connections to the speed of our kit. Here we have our high voltage power supply leads. We have our positive lead that's connected to the plus DC bus. And we have our negative lead that's connected to the negative DC bus. Here on the motherboard, we have two means of driving the devices. There's an optional control card that would plug into this connector. But today we're actually going to use external function generator to supply the PWM signals. The two jumpers here, we have both of them in the BNC position, although since we're just driving the lower switch, this is the only one that's really important. This is our connection coming from our function generator and this is our 12 volt control power supply. Now we're gonna show you how to make the connections to the daughter card. First, we're gonna take our times 10 probe and we have a BNC to MMCX adapter. We are going to plug that into the VGS lower position and we have a BNC cable with the BNC to MMCX adapter. This is going to be our current measurement and we're gonna take this BNC and plug this right into our ID test point. And last, we have a times 100 probe with the BNC adapter. So that's actually gonna plug here. So now we're gonna plug our power card into the motherboard. Now 
that all of our connections are made, we'd like to show you some tips to help reduce some common mode artifacts that will sometimes show up due to the fast switching speeds of these devices. We typically will use a nanocrystalline core and put several turns of each cable through the nanocrystalline core. This just really helps a lot with reducing the amount of noise that's picked up by the probes and to reduce any type of common mode artifacts that will show up time to time. Now before we start testing, let's talk a little bit about safety. For our setup, we actually have this contained into an enclosure and this enclosure features an interlock. And we have this interlock tied in with our high voltage power supply. So anytime this door is open, the power supply is completely de-energized and there's actually a discharge resistor that bleeds the DC link down to safe levels. There's actually a red LED that is present on all of the power daughter cards. And whenever the red LED is present, that indicates that there is potential hazardous voltage present, but you should always verify this with a calibrated meter. Now that we're ready to start taking our measurements, the first thing we need to do is de-skew the setup. Depending on your setup, things like cable lengths will introduce different propagation delays, so we need to make sure that our VDS and our ID signals are in sync with each other. And to de-skew, what we found works very good is we take a non-inductive resistor. We found that roughly five ohms works pretty good for de-skewing our discrete devices. Our air core inductor is completely disconnected from the circuit. So we're gonna now take our non-inductive five ohm resistor and we're gonna plug this into the upper switch position. On this power card for our K package devices, we actually have provisions where you can plug in your D-skew resistor. So we're gonna do that now. So now, before we put any voltage on the link, we're gonna go ahead and close our safety enclosure. So we're gonna turn on our control power and we're gonna make sure our oscilloscope is set to trigger. So our gate pulses are present. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start putting a little bit of voltage on the link. For the DC process, you really don't need to put more than about 100 volts or so on the link. So first we gotta turn on our safety interlock. So now I'm just gonna walk the voltage up to about 100 volts. And we're going to trigger our oscilloscope. So while we're de-skewing, we actually don't need the gates on this oscilloscope, so I'm actually gonna remove that. So we're just gonna adjust the scale of our waveforms. And so you can take either waveform. We normally take the current waveform and we need to invert it. And then we're just gonna change our offsets. And what you wanna do is set the scales until the voltages are completely laying on top of each other. Now that we have our two waveforms that are laying on top of each other, we're gonna need to zoom in to see how close our edges are. So I'm gonna turn on the scope zoom function. So we can see here that there definitely is some delay between the two waveforms. You could actually change the timing on either channel one VDS or channel two. We typically will take the current waveform and we will apply our D-skew there. So depending on which oscilloscope you're using is maybe a little bit different, but somewhere there's gonna be a D-skew setting. And for this one, this looks to be approximately, I'm gonna say about four nanoseconds. So let's dial that in. And then I'm gonna trigger that again. So now our two waveforms are laying right on top of each other. And just to be accurate, we wanna go and look at the other edge as well. That looks pretty good. So at this point, we would say that our scope is de-skewed and we are ready to remove the de-skew resistor and put our inductor back in the circuit and we're ready to start taking measurements. So now I'm gonna show you how to take double pulse measurements. You should have already de-skewed your setup. It's very important that you do take the time to de-skew your setup. If you don't, 
it's very common to have errors of two, three X in your measurements if you don't take the time to do the D-SKU setup. We've removed the D-SKU resistor already and we now have our inductor in place. Typically, you wanna size your inductor so depending on what your target currents are, you wanna keep the pulse width as short as possible to minimize the self-heating in the part. So for this, we actually went with a smaller inductor. This one is approximately 77 microhenries. It's not necessary to use that exact value. So we already have our probes connected to our power daughter card. So we're gonna go ahead and plug that in. We're gonna close our safety enclosure and we're gonna turn on control power. So the part that we're testing now is a 650 volt MOSFET. So we're gonna raise our link to 400 volts. So our link is now set at 400 volts, so we're now going to trigger our function generator to supply our PWM pulses. So we have our waveforms on the screen now, so you can see the two gate pulses shown in red. This area is where we will be zooming in to take our turn off energy or our E off. And here is where we're going to zoom in to take our turn on or our E on measurement. Let's go ahead and turn the zoom feature on on our oscilloscope. So we will start with E off. So now that we've zoomed in, we're gonna turn on a math function. We have our math function on the screen now and we are at multiplying channel one with channel two, which is our VDS multiplied with our ID. So now we have the instantaneous power in our lower MOSFET. So what we're gonna do now is we're going to put some cursors up and we are going to set our interval. So this is turn off. We want to set the first cursor to where VDS is at approximately 10% of its off state voltage. So that's going to be around 40 volts. So I'm going to adjust that one. So that's pretty close. And the second one we are going to set to where the drain current has fell to 10%, so we're actually switching at about 20 amps. So I'm gonna look to set that cursor right about two amps. So that's pretty close. So here we've already set the area up and I have the scope set so that the area measurement is gonna be given between the two cursors. And it's showing me that I have 50.13 microjoules. So that would be our E off measurement here we're gonna do something very similar to take the turn on or our E on energy. So we are going to move our zoom and we're just gonna to go to the beginning of the second pulse. So the math, we're gonna to need to rescale that. That's pretty good. So now we need to change our cursors. So for Eon, we're gonna set the first cursor to where drain current is at about 10% of the target current. Our target current is 20 amps, so that's gonna be about two amps. So that's pretty close. And our second cursor, we're gonna set that to where the drain voltage has fell to about 10% of his off state, so that's gonna be about 40 volts. So that's pretty close. So we can see here that we have approximately 162 microjoules. So this would be our E on or our turn on energy. Now that I've shown you how to capture E on and E off manually, it's worth mentioning that some oscilloscopes, such as this Tektronix scope, can make these measurements for you automatically. One of the things you're gonna wanna do is to experiment with your value for RG, because as you change RG, you're gonna see the peak of your VDS, it's going to change, and that's actually one of the trade-offs that the speed valve kit make very easy for you to analyze. Depending on your system's requirements, you're gonna wanna tailor this value of RG to meet your EMI requirements, your peak overshoots, DIDT, DVDT, and all you have to do is play around with your gate resistance and you can just keep going through this process and then you'll be able to select the value that works best for your system.
So up until now, we've been taking all the measurements on a TO247 four lead package. But one of the major benefits of the speed valve kit, it allows you to make comparisons between completely different packages. Here we have a couple power daughter cards with different surface mount packages. One of them is a TO263 seven lead and the other is a toll package. And this allows you to swap out different devices in completely different packages. And it allows you to take these measurements and figure out which one works best for your system. Another thing that the speed valve kit makes very easy is you are able to swap out and try different gate drivers from various industry leading gate drive manufacturers. That way you're able to test your devices with different drivers which all have different features, different functions, and you can select the driver that performs best for your system. The speed valve kit supports both double pulse testing as well as high power testing. Each power daughter card comes configured with a shunt resistance for the current measurement and it is optimized for high power testing. If you're mainly interested in double pulse testing, we recommend that you increase the resistance of the shunt or you can use the included current transformer, which is another way of getting really good, accurate double pulse measurements. The user guide will explain how to make the modifications to your power daughter card, depending on which method you want to use. Here is actually one of our power daughter cards that has been modified to use the included current transformer. So the only thing that you need to add is this connector to the motherboard, which outputs the current signal, and then you're gonna run that into a high bandwidth current transformer. By using this combination, you're able to get very accurate and very clean double pulse measurements and waveforms. We've covered all the fundamentals to perform an accurate, clean double pulse measurements. To learn more, contact your WolfSpeed representative or go to wolfspeed.com slash speedvalkit.